Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, really excited to talk to you about DevOps and what it is, and then kind of use GitLab itself to help explain uh, even deeper what it means to do DevOps. And so today we're going to cover, you know, what DevOps is, just a quick overview of kind of what it is and why it is. Uh, then we'll talk about GitLab and what GitLab is and, and why it is and how the two relate. And then we'll review each of the GitLab stages, which correspond to uh, DevOps stages, so that you can understand how each of those fit into the DevOps lifecycle. First, by way of introduction, my name is Brendan O'Leary. <clears throat> I'm a staff developer evangelist at GitLab, which means that I get to spend time uh, with other communities and our community uh, and folks that are really trying to get code shipped into production and understanding the problems that exist there. And, and we'll talk about what code shipped into production means even uh, in this talk. Um, but in that time I get to spend, I, I learn a lot about how other people are thinking about shipping code. And, and I think it's really valuable and, and it's exciting for me. I love doing it. Uh, but before I was an evangelist, I was actually a product manager for one of our stages here at GitLab called Verify, which again, we'll learn about a little bit later. And before that, uh, I spent time in uh, working for the Department of Defense as a contractor, a, a software contractor delivering software to uh, the Special Operations Command. Um, and then before that, I worked in healthcare software for about 10 years, and I uh, helped run a small healthcare business, uh, software business focused on women's imaging and mammography. Uh, and so I've seen a lot of different kinds of applications of software and, and how you know, applying software to a problem and then also the problem of getting that software to the people that need it, uh, how those two things can interrelate and all the problems that come up. I'm also a board member on the CNCF. So the governing board of the CNCF helps uh, to guide that, the CNCF being the Cloud Native Cal Computing Foundation. They're the folks that uh, house hundreds of cloud native projects. Probably the most well-known of them or definitely the most well-known of them is called Kubernetes. Uh, but there's lots of other cloud native open source projects that are held in that foundation. Uh, and so I'm, I'm proud to be able to serve as a board member there and help kind of direct the community around those open source projects uh, and how we, uh, how we administer them. So that's really exciting. Uh, you can also reach me, um, of course, through the class uh, methods and then also on Twitter at O'Leary Crew. That's uh, just my last name and then C-R-E-W, like crew. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, of course, today, uh, but then also going forward as you're looking into your career uh, in software engineering or, you know, related fields, uh, I'd be happy to, to talk with any of you and, and share what experience I can uh, about that. But today, what we're really going to focus on is, you know, this concept of what is DevOps, right? This might be a term that you've heard before. Maybe you haven't heard it before. Um, it's entirely possible. Uh, it's not necessarily something that is easily or often like taught in many classes in computer science, um, but it's something you, all, you also hear a lot around computer science and software engineering and, you know, this concept of, of DevOps. So, so what is that? Well, I think even before you get to that, you have to talk about, you know, this, these two words that we've munched together, right? Dev and what's dev and, and what's ops, right? What, what are these things? Um, and, and why do they matter? And then why did we make this new word? Well, you know, de dev refers to development and the development of software and ops refers to operations and the operation, operationalizing that software, making it uh, available and uh uh, stable in an environment where people can use it. Um, but, but then, okay, why did we need this kind of new word? Well, first, here, here's this thing, like, it's very clear um, that software is, you know, our present and, and really our future. So over 10 years ago, there's a famous venture capitalist named Mark Andreessen, and he said that software is eating the world. And I would say at this point, software has eaten the world. Right, companies uh, all around want to do their best, and organizations want to do the best for their stakeholders. Um, but it's not just being the best in your industry that counts anymore, uh, but also being the best in deploying and leveraging software in your industry. Those things are kind of one and the same now, and, and that's why it's such a great career path for folks because, you know, every company has or is becoming a software company. 
Uh, and we've, we've seen that only accelerate in the past uh, few years as we've had to find new ways to connect with each other during the, the pandemic. Um, we've seen this huge acceleration in the move towards uh, becoming software companies and, and leveraging more and more software to help um, companies succeed and help organizations succeed, help governments succeed. It's not just uh, companies, it's really any organization these days. And so let's talk about kind of how that came to be, right? And and you say, that's great. Like, I'm already on the path there, Brendan, I'm on my way. Um, but today I want to look at what, you know, what it looks like once you've, you know, learned how to code and you know, what the industry looks like and, you know, what, what all these buzzwords are about, right? And so to start, I think it's easiest to start from what we know. You, you may, some of you may have experience, um, you know, just playing around and with their own, your own code, right? Almost everyone who's a professional software engineer <laughs> has a story about, you know, kind of messing around with a computer when they were young or, or some code. Um, and when you're doing that, that's a, that's a workflow that makes sense, right? I've got code on my computer, I can compile it and I can run it locally. Um, I can debug it and see what changes, like just when I'm, you know, interacting with me and my computer, it's great. Um, and, and that's, again, an experience that a lot of folks have had and maybe you've had or you will have as you continue your education. Uh, and a, a great story here that I think really pinpoints this, uh, you know, difference between the developer workflow when it's just me and then getting something into the world is a story that Kelsey Hightower um, tells. He, he's a product person, used to be a developer advocate at Google, uh, probably one of the best known folks in, in our industry. And, you know, he's definitely who I want to be when I grow up. Um, but he was giving a talk and he talked about how he was teaching his young daughter, like HTML and CSS to like make a web page and design it and put what she wanted onto it. And she made it and she had it running and she said, oh, I want to show it to my friends so I can just send them HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000, right, dad? And he's like, I had took a breath. And so, you know, localhost is just her computer, localhost. And it's not on the internet. And so he, he realizes, oh, I've got to teach her all this other stuff now just to be able to share that website that she made with her friends. Because of course they can't get to just her computer. Um, it, it, she's got to put it somewhere that it's accessible from the internet. Um, and that's, that's a big challenge. And so there's these kind of two major challenges when we go from this kind of, you know, academic or playing around version of, you know, coding on our own to wanting to then share what we're building with the world, right? And so first is we're going to want to have probably more than us involved, right? We're going to want to collaborate on that code with friends or colleagues at work if we're, you know, employed professionally or, or anyone if we're creating an open source project maybe. And then two, you want to run the code where someone, you know, somewhere where everyone can see it, right? Probably, I mean, maybe not everyone, maybe it's only an internal tool, but certainly more than just your computer, right? Um, and probably to the internet and to, you know, app stores and where you really want um, those folks um, to be able to see it. So let's, let's talk real quick about these two challenges. First is that collaborate on code. And there's really kind of two ways that can happen, right? So you need source control. You need this area where you can save the files that everyone can access it. So of course you could do that in like sharing folders back and forth and me send you my new code and you send me yours. Um, but that's really tough. You know, think of it as like, hey, we wanna work together on a group project and we've got to create a document at the end. And you know, what would that be like on in Microsoft Word typically? Well, it's like, I'm gonna have multiple copies, one person's editing and I'm gonna send it back. Right, this is the old school days of just having Word on your computer, um, but with Google Docs and then of course you know Word on the web now, you have this ability to multiple people to edit at the same time. There's only one copy of it. You don't have a conflict where you know I'm changing the same thing as you and and we we don't see those changes together. I can give feedback in real time, and this is the kind of the basic tenet of source control or what is the Git in Git in our name, GitLab's name or GitHub's name. Git is this open source tool that allows collaboration and merging of folders full of source code between developers. And so then once you have this concept of source control management, something to manage all those files, now you can move things much more easily. So this is like then a super complex version of like what a perfect flow looks like. But the basic idea of Git is I can create my own branch, work on it until what I was working on, you know, is, is functioning the way I want it to. 
And then I can merge that code back into the default branch that everyone else is using. And only then do my changes impact other people or get sent to the customer, right? And so we have that, that merge point on that, that right-hand side there um, after the changes are approved where you know, that's the point where the code is merged and everything before that on my own branch is safe from, from other folks and doesn't impact their workflow. And, but then that send it to a customer bit, right? That's the other challenge, right? In some companies, you know, back in the day, that's literally sending someone something, a CD in the mail, right? That used to be how we would send software to customers. Um, but that's not how it works most of the time these days, right? Most companies run what's called software as a service or SaaS. That is, you know, a website or an app that runs on computers that are on the internet, in the cloud, that can be accessed from anywhere. Um, and then back in the day, which again, wasn't that long ago, these were also two separate jobs. Developers were writing the new code and writing new features. And then operators teams were shipping that as a CD or, you know, more, more, more likely shipping that into their, their websites and apps. Um, and a lot of what you had here is this wall between them is where you, you'd hear about developers throwing code over the wall, right? They would be done with their side and give it to the operators and say, good luck. Uh, and that caused lots of problems because they had conflicting kind of uh, motivations, right? A developer's motivation in this case is to you know, get new features out as fast as possible, change it as soon, often as possible. And the operator says, well, I want the system to be secure and stable and reliable for our customers. So I don't want to change anything quickly. Um, and so it's kind of that dichotomy that led us to this concept of DevOps, because it's not workable, you know, in today's world to, you know, kind of have this, this line between things and have these misaligned incentives and be able to, and be slowed down by the fact that people aren't aligned, right? That's like trying to rent a DVD out of a storefront just a little bit better while Netflix is doing this streaming thing that's you know, just completely eating your lunch, right? That's, that's how industries get changed by software. And so kind of as a software industry, we invented this term DevOps. It was about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And it's to me, you know, it's all one job, right? Getting the code changed and live and getting feedback from customers and then approving the code again isn't like a waterfall that steps down between people. It's more like this cycle right, that is constantly moving, right? Software is this moving target that's basically never complete. Now, of course, that's a concept that's much easier to talk about, uh, and I think it makes maybe sense to you if I've done a good job of explaining the challenges before DevOps, uh, but it's much tougher to implement in reality. And so that's where, you know, of course, <laughs> being software developers, we solve that with, with software, and that's where GitLab kind of kind of fits in. Um, so here, you know, GitLab is this idea of if you're going to have a single way of thinking and a single, you know, almost single team of folks aligned to the same thing, then you want to have one place where they can do that. Uh, and there are many kind of iterations of this before something like GitLab and the modern day DevOps platforms existed. There were folks that tried to stitch together lots of different tools. Um, but again, you ended up with operators having a tool and security people having a tool and developers having a tool and they weren't really able to talk to each other. So the idea of a DevOps platform uh, like GitLab is to give you one tool where you can do each of those stages of the DevOps lifecycle um, one by one and do them all in you know, a tool continuously without having to, to kind of go back and, and, and rework things or wait on someone else to be done with something to continue the next step in the, in the chain. And we're gonna talk about each of these, um, uh, these life cycle stages, right, um, below in just a little bit. Um, but just to kind of give an overview, right? You have this managed stage that you can put at the front or the back, I actually put it at the back of the slides later because it's something that kind of overstates all of those stages, which you wanna be able to manage uh, your developers and your users and folks that are involved in the system um, but, you know, a lot of the software development lifecycle starts with planning, like what do we want to build, uh, what does the customer want, what are the requirements that are, the customer has, what are the requirements our business has, you know, what's the most important thing to work on next, uh, that planning has to happen. And then, of course, you have the creation of the software, the actual, you know, writing of the code. Um, and then, as we mentioned, you're going to want to collaborate with people as you do that, so you're going to have to 
have a way to merge those changes back together and approve them and all, and all kinds of other things as you're creating the software. And then you want to verify it works. So you're going to want to do testing and continuous integration to make sure that you know the software runs and, and works as you expected. And then you're going to package it up somehow, right? There's lots of different ways to package up software. You know, I'm not talking about a CD package, uh, but there's lots of different uh, different software packages that you might put it into. You might put it into a Docker container. You might put it into a, a package that gets consumed by an operating specific kind of operating system. Uh, and then next, you want to make sure the software is secure that you're writing, right? You want to make sure that you're not introducing security flaws or you're, there aren't any known security issues with the software you're producing. And then once you know that you can, and you have it packaged up, you can then release it, right? And say, okay, this is the release. And at this point in time, this is the version of the software we're releasing. And we know that that's in our production environment or our stage environment. Uh, we want to know where that is. And then we're going to want to configure those environments and say, hey, what, how does this work? Like, do we just ship it all to production at once and call it a day? Or do we you know, do some sort of smarter um, rollout of, of changes? And then regardless of how we get there, we want to then monitor those changes and say, wait, like how are things working? Um, and, and are they working together and they're working as expected and are they up and running and, and efficient? Uh, and then at the end is, you know, protecting the environment as well. So it's not just writing secure code that goes into security. It's also protecting the environment and the network that we're running on uh, that are really critical to securing a software, which is something you hear a lot about these days. So again, we're going to go through each of these individually, uh, but first, wanted to give you that overview and then wanted to give you a little introductory video uh, about GitLab. And I'm not sure that I'm sharing my sound, so I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare that screen, making sure that I'm sharing the sound. So I apologize if you heard it start, but you're going to hear it again. All right, here we go. Oh, nope, I don't think I was because Zoom needs my permission. Just Hopefully, you should be able to hear it now. The landscape of software development is changing. Today's users expect applications that are always on and accessible everywhere. To keep up, centralized apps are shifting to distributed cloud services, built and run by teams all around the world. With all of this complexity, software teams need a DevOps solution that enables them to become faster and more efficient while staying secure and reliable. Luckily, there's GitLab, a complete DevOps platform delivered as a single application. Get powerful collaboration capabilities like agile planning, version control, and code review, multi-cloud CI CD that enables you to deploy anywhere, and built-in security and monitoring right out of the box. GitLab makes you fast so you can meet business demand and react to disruptions. GitLab makes you efficient, helping you improve productivity, reduce rework, and work from anywhere. All while helping you build and maintain trust as you reduce vulnerabilities, streamline auditing, and stay compliant. What's more, everyone can contribute to this open source application, so GitLab is continuously improving. Are you ready to deliver better products faster, work more efficiently, and reduce security and compliance risk? Try GitLab today. Okay, great. So that, that kind of gives the business case for why someone might you know, look at GitLab. Um, but I want to dive like a layer deeper than that and talk about each of these stages. And uh, evidently, I forgot I had this because I, you know, this is where we would do that overview. So let's do a quick um, recap, right? Planning, plan what we want to do create, actually writing the software, verify, make sure it works, package, put it in a, you know, a bow on it and tie it up, secure, make sure that the code we're gonna be shipping out is uh, written securely, release, you know, mark it at a point in time as this is the release, configure, make sure the environment is the way we want it, monitor, make sure it's actually working the way we expect it in production and protect, protect the environment that it's running in. Um, so again, we're gonna go into each. So let's talk first about planning. So the planning stage, uh, as I mentioned, it's like, hey, what are we going to work on and, and when are we going to work on it in what order, right? So organizing with a team, what you're going to work on, uh, how it's going to work, uh, what are the requirements, what are the designs going to look like? And then portfolio management means like, okay, if we're, that's a one project, what about the 
you know, totality of all the projects we're organizing. How do those things fit together, uh, right? Because oftentimes software is made up of multiple projects that might have each have a team working on it, um, but they all kind of come together into one product in the end. And so we have to understand at a higher level than even the project level, what we're working on and how those things interrelate. But then once we've got our issue, right, our, our thing we're gonna work on, um, one of the issues maybe here from this issue board that we're looking at, then it's time to start writing the code, right? And we might do that on our own computer. We might do that on the web IDE uh, in GitLab. You'll get to learn about that in a later course. Um, but then once we've written our code too, we have gotta submit it um, for code review so that the folks that, um, you know, maybe the engineering manager or our peers are gonna review that code and make sure it kind of conforms to our standards and uh, does what we want it to do and doesn't have any obvious glaring issues with it. And then GitLab's gonna track all of those changes. Here we see this massive graph of changes coming and going from the main line uh, branch. Uh, this is a little complex version, but you know that that's what Git at its core and GitLab does is track all of those changes and understand how they interrelate and merge together, et cetera. And then once they're merged together, we're gonna wanna run integration tests. And so continuous integration or CI, you'll often hear it referred to as CI, means, hey, we wanna, now that we have the code, we wanna run the tests and the build to make sure the code runs, right? We might also wanna test for uh, coverage of that code. Like, do we have enough unit tests to cover all of the code that we've written? We might wanna write uh, or, or do some usability testing to say, hey, does this meet our usability standards? Performance testing to say, you know, under load, does this still perform really well? And then accessibility testing uh, to make sure that it's accessible and we haven't caught, introduced a problem that might be, uh, might cause a problem for someone who uses a computer differently than you and I do. Um, and lots of other kinds of testing that can happen, but all of that happens in the, the verify stage. And here we can see a pipeline of the build to the test to the deploy, right? That's, that's something you'll hear a lot talked about in continuous integration or CI. And like I said, once you've got it, the pipeline run, you want to package it up maybe, right? You want to put it onto a package registry so folks can download it to their computer, or maybe you're going to put it into a Docker container that you could then deploy into your environment. Um, and you may also want to proxy dependencies that you're using in your software. So the lenders or registry allow you to put your packages into the registry. It also can allow you to, as kind of a proxy between all of the world of open source uh, packages and then the thing, ones that you're specifically using in your environment so that you can understand uh, what those are and, and be really careful about bringing in uh, packages from outside. And one of the reasons that's important is for security, right? So you wanna make sure that you're writing secure code and things that help you do that are things like static ap application security testing or SAST or dynamic application security or DAST. Those things look at the code either statically or while it's running, static and dynamic, to try and find issues that might exist based on how the code's written. We also wanna make sure you don't commit any secrets to Git, right? Git isn't made to store passwords or AWS credentials or other secrets, so we wanna make sure there aren't any of those. <coughs> we also wanna make sure you're writing quality code, right? That, that can impact security as well. And then any dependencies that you are bringing in from open source projects. So, you know, in Java, think of Maven packages, or in Node, think of the Node, uh, the package.json and the Node modules folder, or, you know, um, lots of other packages, you know, name your, your programming language, there's probably a package manager involved in bringing in open source dependencies. We want to make sure none of those have known uh, security issues with them. There's actually a lot of other things I don't even mention here that go into security, uh, which is just suffice it to say that security is a very wide uh, discipline and, and involves a lot of things. But once you are fairly confident that it's secure, you're going to want to then release and deploy that code. Uh, so you might do that through what's called continuous delivery or CD, right? So you, a lot of times you hear CI, CD, and that means continuous integration, continuous delivery. Uh, you might want to have flags that turn features on and off to test things in your production system as you, after you've deployed it. You might want to orchestrate the releases into different places, right? You might have a a staging environment where you put the release first and then a production environment when you're happy that it's generally working. And so all that kind of environment management happens in the release stage. And then the configure stage is related to that, but basically kind of manages those environments, right? Like let's say we have infrastructure as code that might 
uh, we might have our infrastructure, that is the places where we're going to deploy, like I want these many servers or this kind of container images, uh, that might be stored in code. And so we might orchestrate that through configure, or we might use something called auto DevOps to automatically deploy our code uh, into Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes is just a, a way of deploying and managing container images that are running. And so that's what our configuration configure stage uh, helps run. And then once it's in that system, in that production or the staging system, we want to understand, you know, how is it running? Are there errors that are being um, noted? Are there incidents that we need to take care of because something went wrong? Um, and so that is the monitor stage where we can monitor what's happening in real time and understand how those changes may have impacted either positively or negatively the performance or the availability of our, of our system overall. And then finally, as we mentioned, it's not just enough to kind of write the secure code. You also have to secure the environment that that code is then deployed into. Uh, so that's the protect stage, <coughs> which includes container scanning, um, security orchestration, host security, and network security for containers. And then finally, again, we saw this at the beginning of the, the stages. Uh, I put it at the end here because all of those things kind of are impacted by the manage stage, which is hey, what is the organization and structure of how we uh, deploy this code? And, and you know, how do, what are the, the groups and the users involved? Um, how do we ensure compliance, right? So a lot of times we'll hear about highly regulated environments like finance or healthcare, where there's a lot of compliance re requirements placed on organizations when it comes to deploying software. Um, and then how do we report on all of this? Like, great, we've got all these stages. We know the code moves through those stages. Well, how long does it take? Um, for code to move all the way from planning into being monitored because it's in production. And so the manage stage helps us do all those things and then also provide for things like auditing and, and other reports. So that's a real brief overview of DevOps and GitLab in general. Um, we're gonna <clears throat> have courses that go forward and talk about each of these stages in more detail, uh, but thank you very much for your time. I look forward to meeting with you. Bye-bye.